was uh, walking up the stairs and I was thinking about how you have a pretty cool animal name, like an animal scientist name. Bump into a character in the jungle and her name is Sarah Boyk. It's like, cool, that makes sense. <laughs> I wish I could say that I agree with that, but I think it's quite a common name, particularly Sarah has a first name. It's uh, very common. But like the best names are kind of common, right? I, I kind of like it. We have some guy, like I have a character named Jack Kelly. I just like That's it. because it's a good name. It's a, That's a strong name. It's a good name. <laughs> I haven't finished any of his stories, really. There's a bunch of flash fiction and short fiction that is throw the name in there occasionally. Um, yeah, Sarah Blake is like that. Like the animal scientist not adventurer because i don't think i want to do that to you more conservationist right well it, it depends most people would just say zookeeper but uh, yeah zookeeper. <laughs> how are how are things going with the zookeeping game in the era of social distancing well in zoos in general i'm not actually working at a zoo at the moment but zoos in general um they're obviously struggling because they rely so much on um the the income that they get from their visitors and, and footfall um but um in terms of the zoos that i know of they're they're doing what they can the keepers are all still going into work and and making sure that the animals are as happy and healthy as they can be um it, it's just a case of of trying to survive really and, and seeing how long this lockdown um lasts until we can hopefully um open back up again how was the zoo doing before you left were they were they functioning like hey we're such a profitable business or were they struggling no they were doing good uh, basically i um quit my zoo job last year um to work for an animal welfare charity called wild welfare um, and it's basically, basically using my knowledge um, to help improve the welfare of zoos around the world, which is great. It's a fantastic job. That sounds um, like a fantastic job. Is that in England it, or do you have to look, relocate for it? No, no, no. It's, um, it's basically, it's home-based. I'm doing a lot of stuff. It's more of a desk job, which I'm getting used to uh, in comparison to zoo work. But um, it's, it's great in terms of um, there is international travel, or there was before all of this. So in December, I was out in Vietnam. Um, oh, wow. And uh, it, it was strange, actually, because I, I go back to some of the places that I talk about in the book. Um, so it was quite strange going back to those. But um, no, it was good. And uh, and yeah, they, they do some absolutely incredible work and, and they really they're very unique in what they do and their approach. Um, so it's, it's nice to be part of that. What kind of approach do they have? Um, they're just very non-judgmental. Um, it, it's not, you know, um, a very strong opinion one way or the other of, you know, oh, we, sh we should z shut zoos down or, or we should um, hail them as, as the best thing in the world. They're literally going in and saying, right, we can teach you guys how to improve this situation. Here's how to do it. And um, and let's form a relationship and, and really work on this. Um, and that's what I love about them. They, you know, they have contacts um that they speak to for years and they get and we get loads of updates of great things that, that the keepers are doing for their animals and a lot of it is you know some of the issues that are out there not all of them but a lot of them are, are through naivety and and a lot of the keepers out there they haven't had the privilege of the kind of training and experience that i had growing up um and wanting to be a zookeeper and it's just introducing that knowledge um in an accessible way to them which is is what wild welfare is all about and and they do a great job well, the place that you worked, was it a sanctuary? Did they rescue animals too, or was it just a straight up zoo? Um, straight up zoo. Um, one of the zoos I worked at in the past before travel, that was, um, they did rescue a lot of animals as it were, but yeah, they were, you know, a, a wildlife park as well. So it's, um, it, it's usually a mix. You get a lot of confiscations that you don't, um, a, a lot of reptiles in a lot of places, they usually confiscated pets. People don't realize how big a snake is going to grow. So they keep it until it's, you know, half yeah. the size of Room and then they go oh I can't handle this anymore let's drop it off at the local zoo and it's a shame because it's it's not very good for breeding programs and that kind of thing but um, yeah. at the same time we're not going to turn this animal away and say well you know hopefully we can look after it and and maybe find it a, an experienced home. Man I grew up in Florida they didn't, <laughs> drop them, they didn't drop them off in the zoo when they got tired of the little snakes they went and just dropped them off down the local lake. So I've Whatever heard. happened happened yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's interesting because obviously right now is, um, well, we've got a lot of things happening with the social distancing and the pandemic, but thinking about the tiger guy, what was that show called? It's on Netflix. Are you familiar with it? 
Tiger, Tiger King. King. I refuse to watch that, so I I've can't. I've only seen the first. That. I've only seen the first episode. It's horrible. It's really bad. I mean, the people are the, the worst animals in it, and it just makes me think that without them, without these dumbasses, there wouldn't be any need for zoos or sanctuaries anyway. It's just like human neglect and greed that causes all the problems. Sea World's closing, I think. Bankruptcy. Huh? Uh, bankruptcy. I don't know if they're closing. I don't if they could yeah. be protected. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? Again, we, we had this conversation before with the last interview. Um, I I don't know how I feel about SeaWorld. I've never been, so I can't really comment on that There's one. There's one graphic I saw. I have never been either. And again, I grew up in Florida. I don't know what that means. Um, I just had no desire. I like roller coasters, and there's no roller coasters there. <laughs> and also, the, the saddest thing in the world, somebody took a picture of the property, of the SeaWorld property, and said... This is the parking lot of SeaWorld, and it showed a giant, vast, black sea of asphalt. And then it pointed to a little, tiny, insignificant little blue spot and said, this is where they keep their black whales. It's like, dude, that sucks. Just makes me really sad. And the tigers, I mean, man, this country does not have tigers. And when, or if something horrible happens, we're going to have thousands and thousands of tigers running around the wild. Potentially. Well, I, I would hope that people wouldn't just set them free, but knowing that there are things like roadside zoos and, and that kind of thing out there, I, I understand that it's a possibility. But um, again, it's it's something that um, we're, we're trying to work on with the charity um, is, to, is to make sure that the welfare of animals in a captive setting is a priority. So it's a difficult one. But um, they, they don't even have one. They have like hundreds of these animals and not just those. Types of they have many of the different types. I mean, do you guys talk to people like that, the the Tiger um, King people? Do you try to work with them? I, I've not been with the charity long enough. Um, I don't, we usually focus on zoos um, in terms of the ones that we've got um, a connection with already. Um, and we, we utilize a lot of the uh, contacts that we've got. Um, for the zoo associations. So in Britain, for example, we've got BIASA, which is the British and Irish Association of Zoos and Aquaria. In America, you've got ARZA. Um, and in places like um, Southeast Asia, you've got CESA. Uh, in Japan, you've got JASA, all that kind of thing. So we try and um, utilize our contacts there. And uh, the idea is if that we can improve welfare standards in the zoos that are in um, those kind of organizations, then they can be the kind of leading the way in improving welfare standards um, in other uh, collections within that country or that region as well. Welfare standards of the animals themselves? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Do you guys rank places around the world? Who has uh, the best welfare? I, I've read a lot of um, uh, kind of articles where, where places are ranked, but it's, it's really difficult. You've got different spaces, you've got different ideas. Um, I've worked in quite a few different zoos and they've all been very different. Um, and they've all got different ideas of what they want to kind of achieve. Um, some places go for conservation on the level of, um, you know, oh, we're going to rescue this snail. This one snail is, is the most important thing. We're going to pour all our resources into this one snail. Um, to breed it and release it and that's great and then you've got others which are more excited about the charismatic megafauna as we call it you know the the elephants the tigers the gorillas that kind of thing um and charismatic uh, yeah. megafauna i love that i've never heard that before charismatic <laughs> megafauna that's the technical zoo term for you charismatic megafauna is it's the the animals that people really want to come and see basically the ones that we're abusing the most to keep in captivity really say that again sorry the ones we're really abusing the most to keep in captivity. Not necessarily. Again, they're, they're, it's difficult to meet their needs or it's harder to meet their needs yeah. because, you know, they're bigger, they need more space, they need more complex um, environments, um, more complex care in general. But um, it can be done. I know some places that do it great and some places that don't do it very well. So it's, it's all on a sliding scale. I think it's interesting, too, because you can have a place that does it great, and then something could happen, and they can't do it great anymore. I mean, that brings up what's happening now, because at one point, people were coming into these places and giving them money, saying, hey, we want to check out your animals. Here's 50 bucks. Now, they're not doing that, right? In the middle of the beginning of their season, it's not happening. How much of a buffer do you think these places have for these animals? I think some of them they they have to have a fair amount as as an emergency um, 
to to make sure that they can they, they have a duty of care to these animals and and that's what's most important to them so um a lot of zoos people don't realize how much money they um donate to conservation charities welfare charities that kind of thing and they've had to tighten their purse strings in terms of that and that saved them a bit of money to make sure that they can keep going um, a lot of people are, are developing Amazon wish lists um, to be able to get enrichment items, uh, food items, that kind of thing. Um, so, so there are ways that they are ensuring that they are surviving. They're, they're, they're run by very clever people. They know what they're doing. So, I mean, it's interesting. You went from a person that was that dreamt about being a zookeeper to working with sanctuaries. Is that is that right? Also, or is it zoos as well? Did you say? I can't remember. I, I've worked all over. I've worked um, in. <laughs> zoos, wildlife parks, uh, rescue centres in terms of more domestic animals. Um, I've, I've worked with wildlife, I've, I've done all sorts. Um, so I've worked kind of across the range, but the, a lot of people focus, uh, they say that sanctuaries and zoos are very different things and they're actually not. Um, sanctuaries um, are basically zoos that don't allow people to come in, but that means that they have less money, they have less of a buffer in times like these. Um, and, um, and a lot of the time they they might not be able to provide as excellent a standard of care because of the lack of money. I'm sure that they are to some fantastic sanctuaries. I write about one in the book um, in Spain uh, called Mona and it's a chimp sanctuary. It's absolutely amazing what they were doing. Incredibly run, but they, they really were struggling for money. Did they close? What was that, sorry? Did they close? I haven't heard. Um, from what I hear, I think they're still carrying on, but um, I don't know how long they can keep doing that for. It's interesting. So you mentioned the book twice already. Have you finished it? <laughs> well, Brian, you have caught me on a really exciting day because this uh, I submitted it at the weekend to Good a... Good for you. Congratulations. Out, and today I got an email back saying that the publisher was interested. <laughs> no kidding. Congratulations. Yes, I don't even know how that would feel. Well, actually, I know it, how it feels it, to have a publisher I, be I interested. I've been shaking Scary. for about an hour <laughs> since Ow. I read the email. <laughs> haven't quite factored it in. I've been I've forgotten to breathe a few times as well. Now it's it's just um I've read this a lot on Twitter, it's it's just a bite. So it's not necessarily a publishing deal or anything like that. They're just yeah. interested. So I've got to send them the rest of my work, um, which I'm frantically editing because I I've edited twice now. I've done two rounds of edits and I still need more to do. Um, but I was assuming that once I'd sent this in, I wouldn't hear back for months. And then three days later, I got this email. So I'm frantically editing. Um, and uh, and then hopefully I can send it over. And hopefully they will like it. Did you get an agent or did you just send directly no. to publishers? Wow. OK. Uh, so I, What I did was um, I researched a lot of kind of small independent publishers, particularly here in the UK. And, uh, and this one's in Scotland, interestingly. Um, and I spoke to a lot of authors who had worked with these publishers as well. I actually spent um, a very strange day at Waterstones. I don't know if, if you have that over there, it's like Barnes and Noble. Um, it's our version of a bookshop. And I went, yeah, okay. uh, I went into the travel section of Waterstones and uh, I basically brought down every single book off the shelf one by one checked out the publisher who published it, checked out if there were any agents involved, like in the acknowledgements page, that kind of thing, wrote them all down in a big long list um, and, and kind of starred the ones which were perspective because they were accepting unsolicited manuscripts. So that way I didn't need an agent. And That's if so I- That's so smart. That's <laughs> such an interesting idea. I've had you know hundreds of these conversations where I've talked to authors and not one person said, you know what I did? I went to the bookstore and I opened up a book and looked at the title page and just scanned <laughs> all that information because they're legally obligated to put that there I mean they have phone numbers and addresses there they have names they of people do, yeah and it's a great wealth of resources as well because reading these acknowledgements some of them were you know they they didn't they barely mentioned their publishing house and you think oh well, maybe they're not as fun to work with and then some of them they were mentioning uh, you know amazingly supportive um people there was cake mentioned there was all these kind of things uh, I just think, yeah that's, that's the people i want to work for <laughs> i mean i don't know if this puts a, a hole in your balloon or not or adds to the excitement but i've heard i talked to a, a friend of mine yesterday from oregon who said now's the time book makers are desperate for material they don't have anything well, they, what this this person said to me um, was that they're actually about to close um, their book submissions because of everything that's going on. Um, so I, I got in there just in time, which was amazing. <laughs> um, for you. 
Um, but yeah, I, I think some some people are having to furlough their staff and that kind of thing just to survive um, once everything goes back to whatever the new normal will be. Do you miss being on your feet and working around the zoo, walking around the Absolutely. zoo, working around the zoo, working with the animals? Absolutely, yeah. No, I know what I'm doing is great in terms of improving animal welfare and that's what I want to do. And when I was working at a zoo, I had all these animals that I'd met out in Asia that, you know, were struggling and and I knew how to help them. I had them wandering around in my head and I kept thinking, I know how to help them and I'm here just kind of taking over in this in, in the zoo. But yeah, now that I'm not doing that, I really, really miss it. I very much do. What are you doing? What did you do in Vietnam when you went out there before all this went down? Did, did you just call uh, so people? Vietnam, or? Vietnam was actually one of my um, first instances of working for this charity. Um, so when we were traveling, we got to New Zealand and uh, my boss from one of my old zoos contacted me saying that this charity, Wild Welfare, they um, were doing this um doing this project where um, they support somebody on the ground as it were so in Vietnam working in this zoo to try and improve welfare standards uh, for three months and um, so I agreed to do it and um, ended up in Vietnam after New Zealand um, really terrified for many many reasons um, and helped to make improvements to the zoo which was fantastic um, it was one of the, the hardest things I've ever done in my life um, and reading through some of the chapters that I write about it is, um, yeah, I forgot just how exhausted I was during that time and uh, and how difficult I did find it at times. I really wanted to quit um, quite a few times and just go home or go to a different country that was easier. But um, but no, I, I, I managed to make some really good differences and, and some of those changes are being carried on and I made some really good friends at the zoo, even though they didn't speak English and I didn't speak Vietnamese. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it, it was a very memorable time, definitely, um, and and one that I think my Vietnamese chapters are probably some of the best in the book as well because they, um, I, I wrote very candidly about how I was feeling, how frustrated it was some days, and and how I just wanted to quit. And obviously, there's plenty of snakes in uh, Vietnam, uh, so I had to deal with yeah. some of that and that kind of thing as well. So um, my my phobia is is kind of one of my story arcs in the book, um, and it's it's interesting because. Now, you know, spoiler alert, it's actually worse than ever now that I'm back from travel. But um, it, it's it one really? of those, yeah, weirdly, yes. Um, but uh, I thought it would be better after travel having encountered snakes and that kind of thing. But um, it's actually worse, sadly. But we'll, we'll see what happens in, in the future. It's really interesting, isn't it? I grew up in Florida. I said this is like three times already. I grew up in Florida. And my, my childhood was spent on the, the golf canoeing, you know, in a canoe with a paddle and we'd go out to islands and there's these houses on stilts and we'd raid them and fish. And, you know, it was such an awesome childhood. It really, really was. We'd raid crab traps. I mean, I ate so much, I ate so much seafood, but now as an adult, I think back about my childhood and it freaks me out. Like you would not believe. I did not know. I knew that there were animals in the water. I mean, that's an obvious one, but there was a picture once that somebody put up Hudson Beach was like right down the street from where I grew up. There's just nothing but hammerhead sharks off the off the coast. Oh yeah, and then we like, saw one like hundreds. Beautiful, hammerheads are gorgeous. Oh my god, it scared the crap out of me. So I understand snakes scare the crap out of me too. I don't <laughs> think I'll ever move anywhere brown just because I'm worried about rattlesnakes living in the toilet oh, or like black you. widows. Across the street, I live on um, East First Street, and across the street there's a little tiny garden. And it's closed. Everything's closed. But there's a sign on the garden gate that says, uh, we are trying to get rid of our black widow infestation. Wow. Oh, great wildlife. Um, what well, kind of, you, what... sound, you sound like you're a bit nervous around sharks, but in the book, yeah. I actually go diving with great white sharks. And they're great. You do? Yeah. Yeah. They're great. Like, you had a conversation they're, they're with them or something. No, I did. I genuinely, I, he didn't talk all that much. I do. <laughs> this is a theme throughout the book that I have a lot of conversations with animals. And um, he was just kind of like, you know, what you doing? You know, he wasn't, it wasn't some kind of great philosophical moment. But what struck me was <laughs> I, I was expecting this kind of this real terror of meeting them because uh, we had to wait for two days for a storm to pass before we could go out on the boat. Mm -hmm. And I kept that whole time I kept thinking about Jaws, I kept thinking about, you know, blood curdling screams and all that kind of thing. But as soon as I was in the water with him, it was so calm. It was just like meditation almost. He was just, you know, he was smiling at me and he was just like, hey, you know, he, he wasn't, you know, swimming after me, desperate to take a chomp out of me, which is not what they do anyway. They, they test bite if anything else. But 
They the chest bike's the one that gets you though. <laughs> it, it's it's <laughs> the one that gets you wrong. It's not the one that you know they they're gonna. Yeah. Act, they're, they're they're not eat man eaters most of them. You know yeah, what I hear. Too. They don't like the taste, but it's honestly, it's that first little nibble that worries me because it gets an artery, it gets the leg, it gets to something and you're not alive anymore. You are at uh, risk, but um, one person I love is um, Bethany Hamilton. She, um, she's a pro surfer with one arm because of a shark attack. And yet she's, she refuses to kind of hate on sharks, which I absolutely love. Does but, she keep uh, surfing though? Does yeah, she keep going? Does she? I mean, she that's does. the part that gets me. Going. That's like the worst one because you're not on the beach. Like me, I don't, I don't really leave the beach. When I was in Hawaii, I kind of went out and did some body surfing and it was fun, but there's no way I'm going out hundreds and hundreds of yards to put myself on a board. That's what a surfer does. You know what I mean? And she does that yeah. every single time. Going to the beach is a different thing. Sitting on a boat is a different thing, but like she, I, got, I lost my arm and I'm looking for it. I'm going to find it or something like that. Are you friends with her, do you say? fine now, but, uh, but I, I just like the fact that she refuses to kind of demonize and villainize sharks in the same way that, you know, the media oh, yeah. has done. But you no, can't I, villainize them, I, can I, you? They're just an animal doing the animal things. They are, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, just because they're bigger and, and scarier than us, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're out to get us. And I, I know me, it's the same with snakes as well. Tell me your snake story. Or tell me one of your snake stories. I love animal stories. I love snakes. I love sharks. I love spiders. I love them. Just keep them away from me because I don't want to die. All right. Well, in that case, do you want to hear an excerpt from the book? <laughs> sure. Yeah. That'd be cool as hell. I'd really appreciate that. Um, okay. Right. We'll, we'll do Vietnam. Now, this isn't technically a snake encounter as such, but it's it's a snake thing. Um, right. Where are we? And they have cobras, I believe, right? Or asps oh, or something like that. Well, when I went back to Vietnam the second time um, in December, I had a very narrow escape from a white-lipped tree viper, and they are oh. pretty damn venomous. <laughs> Wait, okay, so that's a story I want to hear too. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I was very lucky. I was actually with a, a herpetologist friend who is incredible, um, and he he's very happy and comfortable around snakes. And uh, he was a hundred yards ahead of me, and uh, he basically. Um, uh, he managed to move it off the road before I came across it. So he um, made sure that I didn't have a panic attack, which was fantastic. And they only told me about it after we we left that area, which was great. Oh, good. Isn't it? I was about, I was thinking to myself, okay, so this guy's in front of you and you saw the poisonous snake. I would immediately venomous. lose all, con I, I'm sorry, venomous snake. I would lose all confidence in the guy guiding me. God, you didn't see the snake over here waiting to ambush me? No, no. Well, they don't wait in ambush anyway. The the issue was um, that evening it was quite cold for Vietnam. It was technically winter. I was still in the t-shirt, but um, so it was quite cold. And obviously the, the snakes are ectothermic, so they need to be able to um, warm up. And this was this little guy, well, big guy. He was out on the road where I was walking, um, and he basically needed to warm up to be able to move. Um, uh, he was just out on the road to try and catch the last blast of the warmth because you know asphalt will will keep its heat for a bit longer um, than the forest will so he was just catching the last bit of warmth and uh, thankfully my colleague moved him before I spied him um, but it was a very close run thing. <laughs> it's fascinating but, so your your career is really really going well it's moving in directions. <laughs> it's very it's it's a strange career to have with a phobia of a snake and and that's one thing that I say in the book actually like have you ever met a zookeeper with a phobia of an animal before neither have I because it's strange. <laughs> But um, this is why I was told to make it the story arc of my book, because it is something so unique and so different. Um, so I've tried to kind of I've put it in there. And um, yeah, I've, I've got the bit here about my Hanoi experience, if you like. Sounds fantastic. Can't wait to hear it. OK, so thankfully, the real snakes had been absent from my time in the city, aside from one crucial place, the Internet. I had joined many expat forums in order to make friends and generally feel more immersed in the world of Hanoi. The only problem with this was that people occasionally stumbled across snakes in the city and would post photos of them on the forum. This led to my unease escalating to full-blown panic attacks. Um, at home one evening, I was browsing the expat forums and uh, a familiar surge of adrenaline burst through my system as a photo of a snake scrolled onto my screen. Several photos and a video depicted a rather large snake which had burst through someone's air conditioning unit with a massive rat in its jaws. Oh my god. I stared at my screen in abject horror for about a minute before my body let me move. 
Um, and basically after that point, um, I was I was convinced I had to leave that night, if not sooner. Um, so I was looking at flights to get out of there. I was um, arranging with my other half. He was a thousand miles away in, in the jungle with a snake living in, in his shower drain at that point, because um, uh, he's, he's fine with snakes. Um, but yeah, basically at that point, I was looking at, at a way of getting away from the situation. And um, I, and I never trusted my air conditioning unit again. Um, later on, I just talked about how I was giving it really scared and furtive looks um, as if a snake was going to burst forth from it at any point. Um, but um, but yeah, I, I eventually did decide to stay and I'm really glad that I did. But that was a really, really horrible night. And being on my own in this city that I didn't know and just convinced that there were going to be snakes bursting out of my air conditioning, you know, it was very difficult to convince myself to stay. Man, they put themselves in the environment where those snakes actually thrive. And you're you have to try to catch them before they you step on them accidentally. Because you're right, they're not waiting in an ambush to kill humans. They're just there because that's where they are. Well, they, they were there first a lot of the time. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, what, evolutionarily? I don't know. What was, I think snakes had arms, legs at one point, right? Am I right yeah, about that? Need, um, a lot of the bow species still have like tiny little vestigial limbs. Um, some of them are internal now. But yeah, they, um, they evolved from, well, I can't remember if they evolved from lizards or alongside lizards or I can't remember what the evolutionary tale is but um, some of them initially did have legs but some of them were around in kind of the, the late Cretaceous period so they, they met dinosaurs. It's interesting because I'm, I don't think a lot of animals actually control their environment like we do. It's they completely... want to control that environment. What's that, a snake? Yeah, what, they want what, to be able to control it. Um, they, I mean, they're very different. They, they receive a lot of um, information, I guess you'd call it, from their environment. Uh, so in terms of warmth, um, pit vipers have um, kind of sensors, um, heat sensors that work differently to ours and that, and that kind of thing. Um, so they receive a lot of information, but um, they'll, they'll control their environment where they can. Um, and they'll control, what, what they want is to be able to uh, kind of experience their their best version so if a snake is cold it'll try and move to a warmer place to try and warm up um if it's adapted to life in the trees it'll go high where it feels safe you know if it's you've got burrowing snakes that will um in the desert that will kind of when they feel scared they'll actually burrow underground and that kind of thing and that they'll certainly interact with their environment and and they need that control to be able to to feel good and that's one thing that we try and do with the charity is try and ensure that people are giving these animals control over their environment what was your animal that you work with primarily at the zoo? Um, it, I had a lot. Um, there were there were a few particulars uh, primates. Um, I kind of fell into primates. I thought I was going to be more of a hoofstock keeper. Um, mm. So working with. I thought um, it was primates. I thought it was monkeys. Some kind of safe sleeping yeah. thing. Yeah, no. There was a very special baboon um, that I formed a very close bond with when I was working with him and um, an Alima troop, which I knew very well for five years and. Uh, squirrel monkeys as well and and all of these kind of creatures i i didn't expect to to like primates and a lot of zookeepers have this story they go into keeping expecting to work with one particular species and they end up falling in love with another completely but i've done some work with birds of prey i've done some work with giant anteaters giant river otters bears is a big one particularly in the book um all sorts bears. of animals bears bears are just I have, I have a healthy respect for animals i really do all these animals scare the crap out of me even the monkeys I just hear really awful things about them too. You just like, you just need to know how to read them. Right. Well, respect them. Don't yeah, turn your back on anything. Definitely. definitely. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, you're. I've had a couple conversations over, over the last week because, of, man, yeah, this this pandemic is an interesting situation. People are home. There's nothing to do. So might as well just start trying to have the trying to have the the the, the podcast conversations again. But you're the first person that hasn't really been mentioning. Uh, Corona. So I feel like you're mentally okay with what's happening on the world right now. And you're confident it's going to be over with and we're going to get back to. I, I would say I'm confident it's going to be over with. Um, I find the more I think about it, the more I, I freak myself out. So I try not to. Um, in terms of for me, the world hasn't changed all that much. I having a, a home based desk job. I didn't see that many people anyway. Um, and um, me and my other half were pretty good at, at just kind of battening down and getting on with it really so we're just doing that um uh, I'm I'm a bit worried about my parents because they're slightly older and um 
and I'm just hoping that everybody does. Uh, my main issue is that I get very angry. I live in a very beautiful part of the world where people do come on holiday and people are still coming on holiday here and they shouldn't uh, for many, many reasons. And when I hear that, I get incredibly angry. So um, I, I, will, I will check in with the news to make sure I know what's going on. But other than that, I try and focus my energies on my book and my work and and just keeping in touch with people um but you know it, you can grumble about the situation all, all you like but it's not going to change anything immediately so you might as well just power on through really i mean i live in new york city they're not, it's not happening here we don't have tourists we have nothing but homeless people that are stuck on the street nowhere to go and that's basically it. people going to grocery stores and homeless people it's uh no i'm, I'm very lucky that i can continue to work um, which I'm very grateful for. Um, but even if I couldn't do my ordinary work, I'd be working on the book or I'd find another project or that kind of thing. So um, if, if nothing else, I would read a hell of a lot of books. <laughs> Are you able to concentrate? Are you able to do the work that you need to do? And yeah, get away from the news? And so Some days it's harder. But um, yeah, I, I just think back to those animals that I know need my help and will benefit from the work that I'm doing. And, and that helps me to focus. Um, it's, you, you'll, you'll gather this about me by now. It is all about the animals. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, right? <laughs> I can tell um, you're a very passionate people, person. And some that's... people will, will believe differently on that one. But uh, for me, it's, it's no question. <laughs> I mean, it's hard to get into the kind of work that you're doing now and not love the animals I mean, you're not doing it for profit i've never heard of a, a rich zookeeper or a rich zoo me owner for that matter. if you come across one do let me know <laughs> but i i'm i am anti-zoo at this point in my life i just do not think that it's a good place at all and i hate the fact that we have to have such giant sanctuaries to fix our own stupidity and what we're doing to the natural world I, mean, I, I is... hate that too, and, and you'll you'll be able to talk to most zookeepers kind of in a way wish that zoos didn't have to exist but the truth is that there is no wild for these animals to live in anymore, anymore right and until we can fix that problem we need to be able to keep these animals safe somewhere well i mean the, the brutal way to fix the problem is to kill them all right because that's basically what you've done anyway but taking them out of their natural habitat even the babies that live their entire lives in zoos and you have to take care of them they're handicapped from that point on, I think. It, it depends right. how you raise them. If, you, if you're talking about a primate and you put pajamas on it and you have little tea parties <laughs> for it and it, it doesn't know how to socialize, it doesn't know how to climb, anything like that, then yes, you are handicapping it and it's going to have some real serious mental issues and behavioral issues as well. I um, do know it, that they, they do put those out into the wild. They, they are able to rehabilitate chimpanzees and some animals that they can go back into the wild some they can. and you know what there are so many species that wouldn't even be on this planet today without the work of zoos so simtar horned oryx shivalski's mm. horses potula snails the list is so so long um of and and people don't realize which is quite frustrating um so you know simtar horned oryx were extinct in the wild there was just um a few collections that had them and they realized this problem and they started the stud book to make sure that the breeding uh, was um, good in terms of genetics to make sure that they were genetically variant. And then they did release them and they have been thriving ever since. And that is all because of the work of zoos. And there are so many stories like that and, and people just don't want to focus on it. So. What kind of animal is it, did you say? A uh, Simta Honduras, they're beautiful. They're a, a type oh, of animal. Okay. They're, they're, yeah, the they're one twisty horn in the middle. No, that, that's a unicorn. No, um, they they've got um, they've got two horns and they they kind of um, they they sweep back over their backs um, like simtars basically. Um, and you've got adax which oh, they've I got see. they've got two twisty horns. But I used to look after a one horned adax, so to to me he was a unicorn. <laughs> Man, I keep thinking about the what is it the white rhino? There's yes. none left. There's none even in captivity now, are there? Or are there? Uh, northern white rhinos, no. Southern white rhinos, yes. Um, and black rhinos, um, a zoo which I used to work at has just had a baby. And uh, that baby might potentially go out into the wild uh, one day. And a rhino that my uh, other half used to work with has gone out into the wild. So, again, it's these. It's amazing that these animals that you've met are now out in the wild helping to repopulate 
it's it's absolutely incredible to say that I've met that rhino that's now <laughs> on the news and is now out in Africa. It's it's just amazing. It just dawned on me that getting an animal out into the wild, like raising it or taking care of it or having it on the zoo for X number of years and then taking it and putting it on the wild. I imagine freeing it is more expensive than actually raising it would be. The oh, preparation of yeah. moving you've gotta, it. You've got to do it in it. stages. Um, depending yeah. on the species, you do either a hard release or a soft release. Um, so a hard release is uh, more for animals that uh, um, would be able to survive um, pretty much instantly. And um, where a soft release is more for mammals um, that need a bit of time to adjust behaviorally and, and make sure that they are going to survive and that kind of thing. Um, but there's some there's some amazing programs that do some really incredible work um, as like a halfway house. Um, so those rhinos that went out into the um, into Africa, they, they were in these I think they were called bomas. Uh, for a while to readjust um, and to get to know each other kind of through bars and that kind of thing and then um, it got to the I'm not sure if they're at that point yet but they they will be released and helping to repopulate which is fantastic uh, the the issue my biggest worry is that they're going to be poached and they've, yeah. they've picked this area to make sure that you know it's protected but again protecting them costs money and, and where does that money come from it comes um. from zoos <laughs> Fundraising, I guess it's fundraising, right? I mean, it's not going to come from the well, government. It's fundraising, but it comes from zoos. Zoos donate so much money to so many incredible causes, and um, and and people who refuse to go, they, you know, unless they're actively donating to to those same conservation charities, then they might actually be doing a disservice to the animals that they love because they're they're not being able to to fund and support the conservation work that does go on. What's really fascinating to me is that in certain places of India right now, you can stand and stare at the Himalayas that at one point were obscured by fog or smog. Yeah. You know what I mean? The idea that humans have made such a devastating effect on the planet and that if we weren't here, things would be immediately better. Makes me well, sad. We, we talked about this last time, didn't we? It's the whole population um, issue is, you know, humans aren't all that bad, but the amount of us that's the problem <laughs> well yeah the amount of us but yeah we are bad though because i want to take care of my children and the black rhino doesn't care about my children so if the black rhino is in my way of taking care of my children i'm gonna kill the black rhino you know what i mean or the snake or the what the spider or whatever it is even if there's like two hundred thousand people on the planet or seven billion i'm still gonna want to take care of my kids and man yeah, you know what gets me this is what these conservation charities are doing. So they're, they're going in, they're not just kind of waving a big flag saying you must not shoot the species. They're going into communities and they are teaching them different things that they can do. They are teaching them different ways of farming. They are, um, some of them are ex-poachers and they're now tour guides um, to, to find these animals so that they can show them to people. And there's some amazing studies where they're looking at um, the, the, the kind of profitability of being a tour guide versus a poacher or, mm -hmm you know and kind of yeah. understanding that ecotourism actually has a better impact on preserving species and the community as well so there's there's things that can be done and and these conservation charities they, they're working with the communities it, it's not a a one plan approach you can't just go in and say right here's a nice patch of grass here's plonking a rhino on it jobs done and dusted it's mm -hmm. it's going into the communities and and teaching people that a, a dead rhino is worth a lot less than an alive rhino. And if you have to put it in those black and white terms, then you have to, but it still gets that message across that don't shoot the rhino. <laughs> don't shoot the rhinos. But I mean, a rhino is really no different to them than the alligator or crocodile. You know what I mean? I just, I remember reading an article not too long ago that there are people in Africa, I think, I think it was in Africa, what country? I'm not 100%. So maybe I shouldn't mention anything, but they lose so many people to reptile attacks like crocodiles and alligators they don't have a number like it's in the thousands every single year again i, I think that and i write this in the book actually I, I think it's quite hypocritical for a nation such as the uk to ask other nations to live happily alongside their predators when we eradicated our own i was about to say the same thing yeah you killed all your bears and your wolves and your yeah. you guys you had lions at one point um yeah and, and, it, and it is a problem but again we need to be providing those solutions um you know a lot of people in the uk are talking about rewilding um there's a lot of issues with that as much as i would love it to happen particularly for wolves but um it there, there's things now that are not 
there that weren't there before. So, you know, when wolves were eradicated, there was probably, what, a tenth of the population that there is now in the UK. And and it's the same, again, like we were saying with the snakes in Vietnam, they are just there. And it's people going into these areas, I, I, I don't know whether it's that they don't know how to act around crocodile filled areas. I mean, when my other half and I were in Canada. Oh, that's their um, water. That's where they wash their clothes and get their cooking water and their drinking water. So they always go there anyway. They can't avoid it. Yeah. It's, there's no other rivers or lakes or whatever. So they go down and they do their water thing. And sometimes, yeah, again, think, you know, the crocodile of, pops up. Charities, I think a lot of those charities are working towards, you know, safe water pumps, not only for safe water, but safe places where the crocodile. Yeah, water is a big thing, think. isn't it? It there's is. There's tons of charities out there that are trying to provide water to people that don't have it or that are food. Um, and they're insecure. doing great work and it's it's brilliant but it's just the, the demand is so high i mean you're dealing with like warlord type situations where if you go in there and you put a well in they'll take it out <laughs> it's not theirs and they don't want those people to have enough resources to be strong enough to fight them off or whatever um i mean if you it, look it's at it like a battle scene it's going to play out like one if the united kingdom let's say a thousand, two thousand, I don't know how long ago you guys eradicated your, your predators, but if you hadn't have done that and Yorkshire, you live in Yorkshire, right? Or am I allowed to even say? I, I don't know. You, I'm you in were. Wales, sorry, but yeah, I wasn't. Wales, there. okay. Wales is an even better example because it is a huge tourist hotspot. You know, if you had the animals there that could hurt the people, the people wouldn't show up, would they? Ah, now would they? Because think about Canada. There are oh, bears. I and people are bears. flying to Canada to go and see those bears. And we did that. And as long as you know what you're doing, as long as you've got the right information, you've got the right equipment and you're sensible, people will flock to do it and to see them. And it's the same, um, some of the rewilding projects that I was interested in about 10 years ago, they they were kind of looking at the, the, the toss up between the potential for ecotourism of wolf watching. I mean, look at somewhere like Yellowstone um, versus the the potential of people not coming near because they're scared. And as again, part of that project has to be education. There's no need to be scared of wolves. <laughs> you should respect them, though. Absolutely. And, and some people will and some people won't. And again, that's part of the education. You need to teach people how to live alongside their predators, how to live alongside everything. I, I, I live alongside snakes and I have to deal with that because where I am is like an adder hotspot. But it's it's living, it's learning to live alongside them and <coughs> things you just have to be aware of. In in Wales, an adder hotspot? Yep. Yeah, so okay. I live near the uh, uh, Pembrokeshire Coastal Path which is very famous. And uh, yeah, there's adders all the way along there. Adders is in rattlesnakes, right? Not rattlesnakes. Uh, that's they're, they're of... a viper. They're, they're our only venomous species. They ain't going to kill you. Like, you know, <coughs> dog, but, um, but yeah, they're still, for me, it doesn't matter if it's venomous or not. I still have to go that. You okay? <clears throat> Sorry, my tea went down the wrong pipe. Okay. I don't think I'm dying, so you don't have to do any like life-saving measures, but... Okay, I'm kind of glad oh, about goodness. that, because I wouldn't know what to do being several thousand miles away. Scream loudly, so it like impacts my chest and the food will come out. That's what will happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, I read, um, it was very interesting, talking about wolves in Yellowstone, how they introduced them, and there was a theory that they were helping the environment. I they had studied, like, I think we talked about this, and and then it turns out it wasn't the wolves at all. It was the freaking beavers they put in there. It, it's everything. So so in nature, you've got these trophic levels. And on each trophic level, you've got different uh, keystone species. And right at the top is your apex predator, such as a wolf. Um, halfway down there, you've got um, your beavers, which are a keystone species because of the work that they do in terms of, you know, rerouting rivers and that kind of thing. Um, and then you've also got your prey species at the bottom, such as deer. And um, again, it's it's something that Britain actually needs is an apex predator to um, sort out deer populations. And it wouldn't be through uh, through killing the deer. So one pack would take down maybe 50 deer a year. So it's not going to impact numbers. But what it will do is create fear barriers. And where those fear barriers are, then sapling trees can regrow and, uh, and, and shrubs and bushes can regrow and the landscape comes back. Now we have reintroduced beavers um, in the UK and it's going fabulously. 
No, oh, beavers are awesome. I love beavers. Yeah, I, I hear I, I hear their tails are delicious. I've never eaten beaver. I have helped um, prepare a beaver pelt though um, when I worked at a zoo, and um, they're, they're very different to what I thought they were going to be. But I love working with beavers. They're they're so shy. Um, my beaver talk at that zoo used to literally be: I turn up and I tell the guests to be quiet, otherwise you won't see them. <laughs> that's so cool that you got to work hands on with animals from part of your career. Yeah. Guess and guessing that's not the same anymore. That you're not hands on with these animals like you were. I'm not hands on at the moment. I hope to be again. Um, it's just, um, yeah, we'll see where the, the path leads, really. You know what else I also like about you? We've been talking for 45 minutes and it's felt like two. I mean, you're such a fascinating <laughs> character. Thank I love you. it so much. Not only are, do you have the best name in the entire world, Sarah Blake, steps <laughs> out of the jungle, chimpanzee by her side. I just see it perfectly. Yeah, you can write my blurb. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to write about a Sarah Blake character and you'll sue me. And I'll oh, be yeah. lifelong. <laughs> Um, it's like remove the h and you'll be fine <laughs> what are you gonna i mean you're gonna have a published book you're working for an entree so. right let's say you do what's the next step for you what's what's gonna be where where's where sarah blake in the future i really don't know and for the first time in my life i'm actually that worried about it um i used to be a very um intense planner of things and intense warrior and i still am a little bit but since coming back from travel things have chilled a bit um, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, I mean, everything's going to be different after yes. um, after the, the virus. So we'll we'll see what opportunities are available. I mean, I'm guessing that there probably won't be a lot of animal work around here. Um, so I might have to do something else. Um, yeah, that's true. I mean, you are a charity. If people are struggling financially, there's no money going to charities. Yeah. Well, th this job is actually only for a year as well. So. Oh, I see. Yeah, after that time is up, then I don't know. But um, I, I'll always continue to support this charity because I really do believe in, I know it sounds corny, but I do believe in the work that they're doing. I really do. It's amazing. It, is your partner back in Yorkshire working for that zoo or does that? No, no, he's, I mean, he's in Wales working for a zoo. So are you, is it that uh, the experience, once you have the experience, you're able to basically transfer pretty easily? No, no, no. Um, so... My partner and I have moved around country and zoos quite a lot. Um, so when we first met, we were working in zoos, which were four hours apart from each other by road. Um, and we did that for a year. And then he moved up to Yorkshire where I was working. And because Yorkshire's so big, I was working in South Yorkshire. He was working in North Yorkshire. So we were closer, but still an hour and a half apart by road. Um, did that for a year. And then we went traveling. And once we came back, um, we kind of wandered around the country for a bit and managed by some miracle or divine intervention that um, we managed to get jobs in the same zoo in Wales. So what do you guys do from here? A year you move on. Does he just stay at his zoo or do you try to get on at his zoo? Well, he's he's pretty happy at that zoo. Um, I'd happily go back and work there, but um, we'll see what happens. Hey, maybe this book will be a bestseller and I won't even have to work. <laughs> I mean, that's so the thing, right? Uh, it, well, I mean, it puts you up in a different place, doesn't it? I mean, it much, much makes you more marketable or marketably different different than you were. It's, it's certainly, yeah, I, I would say I, I live my life quite differently. I'm a bit of a nomad now. I didn't used to be. I used to be quite a homebody. But now that I've discovered that wandering around is, it brings you a lot of opportunities, then I'm quite happy to do it. But we're pretty settled in Wales for now, so we'll see what happens. Have I, did I ever ask you what you thought about Jane Goodall? About what, Sorry. Jane Goodall, the chimpanzee oh, lady. Goodall. Well, I've never met her, but um, I, I've heard good things. Um, she certainly um, did an awful lot of great research. Um, I'm not up on chimps. Um, chimps, frankly, scare me quite a bit. I, it's one animal that I wouldn't really want to work with. Yeah, uh, man, what they do and what they're able to do scares the living crap out of me. It's like, oh, man, you look so cute, but you can rip my face off with those teeth and what you do otherwise, after my face is gone, I don't want to be alive to witness. And I, here you are, so <laughs> I'm not going to hang out with chimps. Yeah, they no, don't they, really... they're one of those ones that I, if I had a choice of what species to work with, I'm not sure I'd, I'd choose chimps. Um, I, I prefer working with um, smaller primates. I mean, baboons, they, they would still you know, rip your arm off if they had a chance, but um, it's all about reading them. And, and we were always uh, what we call uh, protected contact. So there's always at least one fence between you and them and, and that makes it safer. And the interesting thing about Jane Goodall is she was a scientist, right? She was exploring what chimps are, mentally, yeah. physically, environmentally, all that good stuff. And then she wrote her book, 
right? And she got catapulted into activism in a way. Okay, I didn't know that's how it worked. I don't know. I, I just was thinking about this as I was ta- I was listening to you talk. I mean, isn't that basically how it works? I mean, is it once you do something and you share your opinion, you can kind of market that opinion to people? I, I wouldn't want to. I, I mean, my opinion is one, but there are many other opinions out there. And whilst I try and back my opinions up with science, then there's there's still equally valid opinions out there. I just. What's your uh, book about? Like what? Like if you had to you're selling it to me on an elevator, what's your elevator spiel? Okay, um, it's uh, global travel using animals as our guide. That's that's my pitch sentence, <laughs> or something similar. <laughs> they, but it was like opportunity. You were looking for opportunities while you were traveling too, right? It's like, oh, we need to find an animal opportunity to continue traveling with. It wasn't like, yeah, oh, there's no animal opportunities. I'm going to wait tables for two months. Well, we, we wanted, the thing is that neither my partner or I are, you know, filled with kind of wonderlust that a lot of travel travelers are. We, we, we weren't after going to countries really to see, you know, see sites and, and do all that kind of thing. We wanted to meet animals. We wanted to meet people who, whose lives evolved around animals. And we did. And, and, and that was a great thing. And, and we still keep in contact with a lot of those people today. And, and you just kind of think that, uh, the animals were great and they were what led us and that's why it's called animal compass but at the same time the people that we met some of them were just they were completely on our level you know they they'd worked with animals for years they they knew what they were doing we learned so much from them and and it's it's fantastic to be able to do that and then to do that with gorgeous scenery behind you is is fantastic mm. as well so right. the the book is um i i shared it with a zookeeper friend actually and she said that there were fewer animals that than she thought but if I was aiming for a travel book with animals, then I've got the right level. Um, however, if I was aiming for kind of nature writing with travel, then I've got it the wrong way around. But I'm aiming for travel with animals rather than the other way around. So I'm quite happy. But you work with animals as a lifestyle. I do, would yeah. You, but would you consider it, yourself a scientist? Yeah, I'm, a, I'm an animal biologist. That's what I'm interested <laughs> in. Oh, you're an animal biologist. Would you continue? Would you or would you get down deeper into the science of of the field itself? If there was a market because for it, but I, I think you know the the the, 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 the education things I'm better at the, the things that I'm better at that I'd rather do. I'm I'm good with practical animal care, but I'm I'm also really good at, at telling stories in the sense of giving keeper talks and giving tours of zoos and and instilling that passion that I have in other people that's what I've been told time and time again I'm, I'm good at so I'd quite like to kind of go back to that if I can and and make sure that people are understanding what they can do so you know their, their choice to eat a little bit less meat or buy less plastic or oh, hell yeah, support right? a conservation charity all of those kind of things they have an impact and if it's they the do person that, that helps with the lemur like, that I introduced them to, then that's great. Your job is to help define a narrative, maybe help define a narrative, not create the narrative itself, because that's already been created over the last 300,000 years, this impact that humans and animals have with each other. But what you're kind of doing, and this is really cool, is you're exploring that impact on different fronts. Conservation. Yeah, I just hope that people listen. <laughs> But I think they are. We're in a really. Think, do you time think they are? Absolutely. Do you think we are? Do you think like um like in the nature? Cause, man, I swear the last generation could not have given a shit less. They had that really cool commercial with the Native American standing on the dusty street crying, and that was so effective. They had the Smoky Bear, that was effective. But yet the world is falling apart. I guess. I, I, I I'm hopeful that we are changing. We're certainly realizing. I mean, just the change in plastic consumption alone since Blue Planet Two is is massive, which is fantastic. But oh, there has been a change in the amount of plastic consumption. Oh, absolutely, yeah. There, there's all I hear shops it... kind of jumping up all over the place. It's it's brilliant. Oh, damn. Coca Cola here is like one of the worst offenders, and they're they're basically using their funds and ability to fight it by saying that they're not the problem; it's somebody else. Um, I hear also scientists have put together a really good plan. They've got this bacteria that they're going to dump into the oceans. It's going to take care of all the plastic islands out there. 
It's like, neither one of these are very good solutions. You're arguing. It's obviously your Coke bottle is a problem out there on the beaches. And you guys should not be dumping nothing in the ocean. I'm sorry. I agree, but, <laughs> but where did all those Coke bottles come from? They came from they, us. It, There's yeah, a very famous quote. That's when my point. When, when That's my point. When people are going a bit crazy about us taking away, pla I say us, people taking away their plastic straws, I understand why some people need them, but 99% of people don't. And when you think about it, there's a very famous quote that came out of it. It's only one straw said 7 billion people. And it's so, so Once true. or three times a day. It's not just one straw a month. That's a daily problem, our addiction that we currently have with those dumb things. So and where I do they come from? Yeah, you're things. right. You there's things that McDonald's. big companies need to do, but there's also things that we as individuals can do. And if you get yourself caught up in all those ideas of, oh, well, it's the company's fault and I can't do anything to help and that kind of thing, that's false. You can. You can. And I'm not perfect at this either. I, I still buy things in plastic, but I try and reduce it. And if you start just by reducing, then you can make a big difference and you can get less and less plastic each time you shop and you can learn ways of doing it differently and that kind of thing. And it, it becomes a way of life. It took me ages to remember my bags for life rather than plastic bags. It took me a ridiculously long time to remember that. But now I don't think twice about it. It's just those changes that we have to adapt to make. You know, the, Pat, the sad thing for me, I think, though, is it's not even us that have to make the big changes. I mean, yeah, they put it on us, the individual. They say, yo, dude, stop drinking the Coke. Stop going to diet. Stop going to McDonald's and getting your straws. But honestly, the finger should be pointed at the corporations that are causing the mess and giving us that product in that way only. They don't have options. They don't have the cons hey, yeah, guys, we've really self-reflected. We're taking away the plastic straws. Here's paper straws. No, they still have the they know the litter. They have the same information that we do, but yet you go to McDonald's and get a plastic straw every single time. I agree that there are problems that big companies need to solve and they have the money to do that. But at the same time, I really think that the finger of blame should be pointed at every single human because we are the ones going back and buying we those do. things. We, we can make responsible buying choices and companies will respond to that. But we still have to buy stuff. We still have to eat unless we're going to go out into the wild and farm and hunt our own food. We're only stuck buying what's available. And the people that are providing what's available are so corrupt and they don't care. They don't want to change anything. The packaging is great scientifically proven to make our food last longer so we make money we don't care what happens to it after you open it it's completely useless then what are you going to do throw it in recycling those are i heard that most of our recycling goes to india and it goes to the slums and that's where they sort through it and what but they what, do with knowing all these things what impact does that have because to me it's depressing and it makes me think oh i might as well just give up then I, it's I politics know. right that's it what the is next stage politics, is but politics but that is for them to discuss, and you can use your vote to hopefully vote but for you, though. person. But... I thought it was us. It should be us. That's what they told us all the way through. Like when I was going through school, they said, your vote matters. Go vote. And if it's true, then I don't know either one of us. It's two people. It's 100% of this conversation that would never in a lifetime vote for plastic straws. No, they should not be allowed to make plastic straws. No, they shouldn't be allowed to keep fucking killer whales in a tiny, tiny pool. They shouldn't be allowed to do that. That's bullshit. Make them stop right now, right? I mean, if it was if it was actually us as a people, I think we'd make the right choices. But this problem of greed is really messing things up, preventing. I, agree. I definitely agree. Preventing. But also, people are so far removed from where their food comes from and and where everything comes from. They're so far removed from it that sad. I think it's sad, right? Fat. Like you're gonna get fat eating the pizza, but really, what does it matter? It doesn't even matter. Just eat the pizza because there's nothing else available. You have to really bust your ass to make the, the quinoa and the whatever. <laughs> I make yeah, vegetarian meals. Yeah. <laughs> I make the vegetarian meals occasionally, but I dream about the pepperoni pizza. You know what I mean? I don't know. Maybe it's deep in our DNA. 300,000 well, years we ago. Are, if, you, if you look purely at stomach design, we are mon monogastric, so we are designed to eat meat, if nothing else. If so nothing else. So... We would there, be happy there's three to types of stomachs in the world. There are monogastrics, hindgut fermenters, and ruminants um, in the animal kingdom. So you've got ruminants, which are four-chambered stomachs, which are cows, sheep, cows, that kind cows. of thing. You've got hindgut fermenters, which are your horses, um, all that kind of thing. Again, they eat veg, um, they eat grasses. And then you've got monogastrics, which is pretty much everything else. Um, and that is designed to cope with more than just plant matter. 
No, I like meat. Do you eat meat? Are you a, are you a vegetarian? Do you eat meat? I was a vegetarian for 13 years, uh, from the ages of eight to 13 years later. Um, I went back after university because for one thing, I learned a lot of the amazing things that um, welfare and farm places are actually doing. Um, and some of these animals, especially in the UK, they have really incredible welfare. Again, if you make sure that you're buying British or wherever you live. Um, and the other thing I wanted to do was actually support British farmers. Um, mm because they, they are people too, and they keep this country and all the other countries running. So as long as you're making those responsible choices, I am happy with occasionally eating meat. And in the book, actually, it was, um, I eat a lot of meat in the book, which is surprising. But the reason was because we were working on farms and we were working in places where we knew exactly where the meat was coming from. So, um, one person in New Zealand, they took a slab of meat out of the fridge and said this was, you know, Grisella or whatever the cow's name was. And and to, to oh, know wow, that the name after the cow. Yeah, <laughs> this is our friend. After them and they have the best welfare possible because you are yeah. responsible for that. That's, that's uh, good. That's awesome. That's a person's cow and animal and livelihood and effort. Yeah. And while you were talking, it did not sound like you were talking about corporate farms where no. they have a sludge pond of shit and blood and piss sitting 100 feet away from their animals. That's my goddamn country. That's what we're doing to animals here. We're not considering welfare at all. We do not care how that animal lives, dies, or really, honestly, anything more than how we get it fed to ourselves in plastic. <laughs> it's really but sad. again, pe people don't realize where it comes from. So, so few kids will look at a beef burger and realize that that used to be a cow. Education. I don't know. That's, okay. That makes me mad, too. <laughs> it's a government i, like I don't debate, we can us. debate every issue in the world <laughs> it comes right back on to us though because we're the ones that are voting for this dumb government i just don't get it and, and then you start wondering are we actually doing anything with our vote and if we're not then well how mad are we supposed to get that's not this podcast because i'm pretty sure neither one of us wanted to get mad we're both <laughs> we're both, we're both soft-bodied writers that's all we do I went for a four mile run yesterday and my foot hurts. So, I mean, I doubt I'm going to actually take any fight into Washington, D.C. and do anything about any of these problems. Well, maybe you could write about it. Maybe. It's but just getting who, people to read it. Nothing maybe. Like that. Who would write about the, dra the dragons and the rocket ships, though? I think that's more important. I agree. Escapism has a huge, huge thing. But I, I am finding, particularly on Twitter, that every person seems to be writing young adult sci-fi fantasy i can't I find people who are writing anything else but that and i agree we need dragons i live in wales we, we are dragons but yeah there, there needs to be people writing other things yeah it's very true actually i don't know would you read literature i mean your book might actually get out into the world you'll be able to walk into waterstone and say that is me Oh, Sign books that people are buying. Yeah, it's so cool. And it's I, one of the first one this, too. I have this little idea in my head of seeing it in the wild, as it were. So like being on a train or something and, and seeing somebody <sighs> read my book. That that is like the ultimate dream. I don't know if that will ever happen, but that's my little visual <laughs> fantasy that gets me through the end. I look forward to like in a number of years going to book expo over here on the other side of Manhattan and seeing you in one of those booths selling your stuff. Oh, that'd, that'd be, be so cool. Well, I've never been to America, so maybe. You've never been to, you've been to Asia. I'm so jealous of you being to Vietnam. It's one of my dream destinations. Well, hey, maybe. if you go, look me up, because I'll uh, be able to tell you some some places to go and some places to avoid. <laughs> Where would you avoid if you went? Again, like, what would you do? Would you go to Saigon? Would you go north? Would you do, I mean, that uh, hurt I'm, a safe place. It's really, like, they drive carefully. It's, it's, it's the safest place to be a solo female traveler, which I found out whilst I was there, and that that made me feel a bit happier. Um, but yeah, it's it's a really safe place, and the people once you once you get to know them, they're really friendly. I found, and I write this in the book, that when when you arrive as a tourist, they're overly friendly, and you can kind of sense that they don't really mean it. And then as soon as you go from tourist to expat, they somehow know. I don't know how they know, but they somehow know, and there's like an instant kind of cold shoulder that happens. Or I found that anyway. And then after a little while, they kind of come around and they're like, oh, actually, you're real, you're OK. And, and maybe we can be friends. And and yeah, they they're wonderful people. Once you get to know them, I, I, I still talk to some of them and they're just fantastic. That's pretty cool. So, I mean, again, I, I think you're cool, too. And I can't believe it's already been an hour and five minutes. I really appreciate you volunteering to come back on after I think I set up two interviews with you. And I canceled both of them. Oh, that's so, fine. 
things happen. Life happens. Uh, my health was just not good. And unfortunately, I had throat surgeries. And the last time I canceled on you, I just mentally couldn't bring myself to talk to anybody. Well, I hope you're feeling better now. Yeah, things are definitely getting better. And please let me know what's going on with um, the publishing. I'm going to keep my eye out. And I'll probably right, send you a message in a few months to see what's going on. Because I'm really curious about my adventuring character that I get to talk to in real life. <laughs> well, hey, if it gets published, you will hear the squealing all the way from uh, New York, I'm sure. I, I will be very excited to... if it gets published. For the love of God, stay healthy, okay? <laughs> will do. Same to you.